um, okay, uh, sh can I show, can I share my screen? Let's see if I can do that. Yes. Okay, can people see my screen? Yep. Yes, you see we got. You see Fredo. Uh, and uh, how's that? Everybody got that? That's great. That's good. Okay, so um, my presentation is called the Plebeian Political Organization State Within a State. Uh, and um, I want to talk about the development of, of this really unusual, really unprecedented thing that happened in Rome. Um, the, the, Greg alluded to the war of the orders or the struggle of the orders, as that's called, it refers to the plebeian order and the patrician order. Uh, and this dominated Roman politics for hundreds and hundreds of years, not, not hundreds, of, but for hundreds of years. Uh, when you read about Rome, one of the things that gives it its unique flavor that makes it so interesting is this role of the of the tribune of the people tribune of the plebs uh who were like a having um uh a an agitator as part of the government who's who's always uh uh agitating against the government from within the government and has the ability to paralyze the government it really kind of totally uh, unusual, bizarre arrangement. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about the, the origin of that. Um, as in my previous presentation, my major source is this book by Tim Cornell. Um, and let me say that, that since, since I, my last presentation, I was doing further research, I started seeing how influential this book has become. So, uh, I looked up a uh, definition of something from the Oxford Classical Dictionary, and the definition was written by Tim Cornell in association with uh, uh, Arnold, Ar Arnaldo Monomiglio. Uh, so, um, and uh, I read uh, parts of something by Mary Beard, and basically she was accepting Tim Cornell's arguments um, and uh kind of i think we're going to see the arguments that he puts forward in this book becoming increasingly the consensus view among historians uh, about what happened during the the early period of rome uh very briefly this is a slide i showed in my last presentation about what are the the evidence i'm not going to go through it in in great detail um, but uh, just to, to characterize it in general, to know that that um, this evidence is highly uh, fragmentary and highly um, uh, uh, inconsistent in many ways. And one of the big differences between reading general histories for general audiences and reading scholarly books and i'll say that that the cornell's book is definitely a scholarly book is that you learn how uh historians are arguing from this really kind of uh thin evidence and how uh on what sort of small points rests ideas that are then presented by um uh, historians or writers for general audiences as being the facts of the way things go uh, even though they may hinge on very, very tenuous evidence that gets uh, changed uh, as there are new archaeological discoveries and as scholars start uh, criticizing themselves. And um, one of the, the major um, uh, down uh, setbacks or, 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 uh, of, of this studying this ancient world and looking at these sources is that there's a tendency of the sources to look at the conditions of at the time they were writing or recently before they were writing, and then just to project that back 
into the history that they're writing about from hundreds of years before. So that is kind of the major way that you get misunderstandings and just uh, downright inaccuracies in the historical record. And we're going to see a lot of that in this in this discussion. Paul, oh, you, you mean that they're very subjective? Not, not, no, it's not that they're being subjective. They're not making it up, but it's just that they look at, they, they take what they experience for granted and they right. think that it must have been, been like that all the time. And right. you can see that, you know, today, you, if you watch, you go to a, a movie uh, about some historical event and you can see them talking about issues that are meaningful today that would have been totally meaningless in the time frame of when they made the movie. But people just take for granted that what's relevant to us today must have been the way it is. So one great example of that is the role of the Senate. The, the historians just assume, going all the way back to the beginning, that the Senate was this uh, powerful organization that, that was the most powerful thing in Roman society. But it becomes clear when you study it back that in the beginning that the, the Senate had very little power. It had no constitutional uh, uh, authority of any kind, and it had no permanent membership. It was uh, basically a council of advisors, uh, but the the sources just really couldn't conceive of Rome without the Senate, or without a powerful Senate or a dominant Senate. So that's what you read about. So uh, a lot of the 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 art of historians is deconstructing this and trying to figure out what's reliable, what's not reliable. And as I said before, what's reliable usually are discussions of institutions. And that's why I'm going to be focusing today on the institutions uh, of, of the, the plebeians. Okay, this is, um, glad Marika is still with us. Um, this is a slide that I showed in my previous presentation uh, where I was talking about Servius Tullius, the third to the last king, who, um, uh, is given credit for establishing the census uh, to analyze the citizenship, citizenry, and then based on that created these uh, property classes. Um, but the scholars that were, well, not the historians, the ancient historians that were writing about this looked at something that was 200 years old at the time they were writing and projected it back to something to 200 years before that, when it was totally inappropriate. Um, and um, let, me, let me say that, that I, I had the, the, uh, the privilege in the last 10 years of, of being able to take a bunch of courses with uh, William V. Harris, who is one, maybe the, the leading scholar of Rome uh, in the world. And uh, Professor Harris, would start his courses off by saying there are three things that you must always keep in mind when you think about the ancient world, which are time, place, and social class. And what he meant is that when you talk about time, you have to understand that we look back and we say the difference between, you know, 300 BC and 500 BC, we just say, well, you know, we'll talk about things that happened in 300 BC as being the, these situation in 500 BC, and that's just wrong. The times change, and even in the ancient world, 200 years was a long time. So you have to, if you're going to argue uh, for something across time, you really have to make that argument of why that's a valid thing to do, and you can't just accept the fact that, um, you know, that you know the conditions of the ancient world in, you know, in the first cent in the third century, because you know something about the first century. Uh, place, the difference between something that happens in the city versus happens in a rural area, it's like a different world, and of course social class, that history is mostly about the aristocracy, because those were the people that mattered, and, and, uh, and it's written by the aristocrats, and we're going to see a lot of uh, the other side in this presentation today. So uh, this is Marika in the last a presentation asked when we, we raised this, this is um, whether this division, which was uh, the way things were and after the fourth century and going down in Rome, whether this was designed for taxation and uh, I didn't answer it very well. The answer is 
correct answer is absolutely yes, that um, this uh, uh, creation, this, this uh, division of the Romans into these property classes uh, is really marks the point at which uh, the, this central institution, the, the Centuriate Assembly, no longer had any military significance. It now became something that was used to represent status, and it was the basis for the introduction of a property tax called tributum that happened at about this time. But if we look 100 years further back than that, and this is what I presented in previous classes, the uh, reform of this, the, the, the reconstruction of the Centurion Assembly uh, that was uh, written about by Cornell, and uh, he basically uh, argues that what was significant here was the division of the citizens into two main groupings, which are those that can afford the armor uh, that, and weapons that would allow them to function as uh, heavy infantry. In this period, we're talking about the, the hoplite phalanx, uh, and uh, as opposed to those that didn't have that that amount of wealth that could only uh, supply the ability to serve as light infantry, which primarily would mean people using missile weapons, javelins, slings, and so forth. These were the two primary divisions of, of the Roman army. Um, and uh, uh, it was Paul, also a political, yeah. Excuse me for interrupting, but was there cavalry? Yes, right, great, okay. thank you. Okay. So. Uh, I was focusing on this, but there are other parts of, of the Roman body that, that, are, that I didn't include in this because it was uh, too complex. But if you look to the left of this diagram, you imagine that there you have the cavalry and the cavalry would consist of the, largely of the aristocracy. Aristocracy historically is associated with horses. Uh, and um, so there, essentially richer and more prestigious than the people in this diagram. And to the right, you'd have the what was called the proletariat, um, which is where our modern word comes from, proletarii. And these were the, the people, those, uh, they were Roman citizens, but they did not have enough property to equip themselves to serve in the army at all. And they were, um, they had no political rights of any kind. They were totally disenfranchised in the Roman system. Um, yeah, so that's a, it, so it's a larger group. Now, this uh, Centurion Assembly, at the time that the Republic was formed, uh, had the, the following characteristics and powers. It was basically the assembly of the soldiers. So the the organization of this politically mapped directly into the, the early Roman legion. It was broken up into centuries. Centuries were the smallest tactical unit in the Roman army, and they were directly linked. But as an assembly, it also had major other functions. So the political functions that it had at the beginning of the Republic were to elect the most important officers, the consuls, later the praetors, but these were people that held imperium. Imperium is the, the power to command, the power to uh, basically inflict the death penalty without appeal outside the city of Rome. Inside the city of Rome, they had to, they, there had to be due process of law. Uh, and they also elected censors, which was the most uh, prestigious office in, in Rome. And these were the people that conducted a census every five years and essentially reorganized the state, reconstituted the state in each census by reclassifying the citizens. They had a legislative function in the Centurion Assembly to enact laws <coughs> and a judicial function. So if some, if, as I said, the, the uh, consul could not unilaterally impose the death penalty on a Roman citizen within the city of Rome and without due process. And what the due process was, was an appeal of this conviction of, of the sentence to the Centurion Assembly. Okay, now the people who established 
the um, the Roman Republic who ex who expelled the king were the aristocrats. And as we see, the aristocrats are essentially outside of this structure in the screen. The aristocrats were not part of the, the infantry at all. Uh, and the question becomes, why did the aristocrats who established the Republic give so much power to this group that's outside and in many ways opposed to the aristocracy? And the answer is basically because they had to. And that's one of the important things to understand about Rome is this constant political negotiation that goes on between competing power centers. So to the extent that the Suturiot assembly was established by Servius Tullius, which is to say a good 40, 50 years before the establishment of the Republic. So this was something that existed already and the entire army was a part of it. So basically, the aristocrats were forced to, to not only grant the powers that the Centurion Assembly had to confirm them, but in some ways to even expand them in order to gain the approval of the, uh, essentially of the army to their declaration of a republic and their ouster of, uh, of the kings. So, the aristocrats. Who were the aristocrats? Well, we talk about patricians, and I'm going to make the point that the uh, aristocrats were not exclusively patricians. But, but uh, though they are dealt that way by most by most of the uh, historians up until Tim Cornell started um, having people uh, reevaluate this. But the, the, what the patricians were, were first that it was clan based. Uh, and the clan, uh, Rome, the word for it in Latin is, is gons, G E N S. And that is the second, that is represented by the second name uh, that we see for Romans. So, for example, um, uh, Greg talked about uh, Marcus Furius Camillus. So, Furius is his clan, the Furii. Now, clans were not families. Clans were groups of families that were not necessarily related to each other, uh, but um, had banded together uh, and were the dominant structure in Rome um, at the time that the Republic was formed. The patricians had prestige based on the acknowledged fact that they descended from the oldest aristocracy in the city. The legend, is, as Greg said, was they're descended from the hundred senators appointed by Romulus. And uh, what, is, what, what Cornell argues is that they were, and not just Cornell, that they were a well-defined group. They didn't spring from, you know, into existence de novo at the, at the forming of the Republic. They were a well-defined group uh, way before the Republic, and they had a number of things that characterized them. Uh, and first was there was a, a structure called the interrex. You've heard in uh, English, we have the word interregnum, which means the time between the reign of kings. Uh, and it comes from this uh, institution that the Romans had between the kings, where there'd be an official called the interrex, interrex who would basically uh, conduct the, uh, be involved in the selection of candidates for the next king. And it was an elective office in, uh, in Rome. And then later you'd have, if, if the, if all the consuls, for example, were killed in battle, there would be an interrex who would handle the election of new consuls. And that was the exclusive province of the patricians. Uh, by the way, pr patricians comes from the word patres which means father. So patricians could be translated as the fathers. Uh, they had this something... is uh, Cato the Elder, right? Or they say... Pardon me? This is Cato the, the, the Elder, right? What about him? No, I mean the picture. No, this, I don't think this is, uh, this is, is known as, this is just called the portrait of a patrician. But this is Cato the Elder. 
I think it's some people have identified it as Cato the Elder, but I think that oh, okay. it's it's in generally known just the portrait of a Roman patrician. There's no real reason to say that it's Cato the Elder. There's no evidence for that. Paul, a question. Where did the wealth came out? I mean, you were patrician and you have all your, but where the, the wealth was based on the taxes or how? No, how no, no. The wealth, the wealth was based on their, their um, situation in the clans and being the, they were warlords. So their wealth was based on uh, having things flow up to the top in a world, in a warlord type structure. Uh, and mostly agrarian uh, lifestyle, <laughs> so it must come from the land. Well, ultimately, it was an agrarian society, but we know about them basically from the archaeology. And the, the archaeology starts to show uh, great wealth in, the, in, in certain burials, starting particularly in the 7th century, in the 600s. And this is always taken by archaeologists to represent the beginning of an aristocracy that once you start to see major riches gold and weapons uh, and things of that sort and import luxury items showing up in graves that indicates that that the society has become stratified and that there are now there's been wealth has been assembled in a small group and it's being uh, buried with them, denoting their status. Uh, and that's where we see the emergence of the aristocracy in this whole section of Italy, not just in Rome, but in Etruria as well. And uh, the material remains for this whole area are identical. Uh, they were all directly influenced by the Greeks uh, and their, their uh, discoveries seem to follow the, the things that you find in Greece by 50 to 100 years. So there was an institution called Octoritas Patrum when, in, in the later Republic, which basically <coughs> gave the, the, uh, patri the uh, patricians the right to basically have to um, okay the decisions of popular assemblies. Uh, and uh, they had exclusive access to all the major priesthoods. We have a lot of difficulty as moderns understanding how important religion was to the ancients, but there was very little difference between religion and politics, basically none at this time. And to, to have control over religious uh, uh, cults and priesthoods basically gave you tremendous power over the society. And the patricians uh, who had exclusive access to the major priesthoods all the way through the Republic uh, until rather late. Um, and still there were always some, the oldest priesthoods, the Flaminates, <coughs> were always exclusively patricians, indicate the, the control that the, the patricians had um, over, uh, over religion. Paul, uh Lisa, again, another quick question is around um, with with religion. Was it like in Egypt where wealth was funneled into like the temples and the priesthood controlled the wealth um, and also created other things like trainings, scribes, etc. Um, the the well, first temple building in Rome was basically the fruits of conquest. So temple building is associated with times when the Romans were militarily successful. And in fact, in times, the, the historians look and they, they look for uh, basically economic depressions are associated with an absence of building, in particular an absence of building temples. Um, the, uh, it wasn't as organized at all as it was in Egypt. In Egypt, the 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 priesthood was tremendously well organized, tremendously powerful. Here, the priesthoods were not, these people were not professional priests. These were warlords, and they would hold the priesthood as one of the offices that they held. They were, but they were not priests. They were not, re, they were not religious figures. The, the priesthood was a, was, was a, a, a citizen uh, 
function in Rome, even though they carried out religious, religious cults, but they were specialist priests that would advise them on how to conduct ritual and, and so forth and so on. Uh, does that answer your question, Lisa? Yeah, that helps, thank you. Okay, so there are some controversial questions about the patricians and this comes back to uh, what I said in the beginning of um, historians, the ancient historians, projecting their current or recent past uh, uh, knowledge onto the more distant past. So the first question is, was the Senate exclusively patrician? And there is an assumption, and at the time that, that uh, Cornell wrote his book, it was the uh, majority assumption among historians, uh, and it's, it's not anymore. If you, you know, if you look at the things in Wikipedia, and so forth, you'll see that, that Cornell's ideas are now becoming the, the standard for what people are presenting about, about Rome. So uh, Cornell points to uh, what was a formula in discussing the Senate, uh, qui patres quinque conscripte, so those who are fathers and those who are enrolled saying that the Senate consisted of two groups. The patres were indeed patricians. That's what patrician means. But this particular Latin, they could have said patres a conscripti, fathers and enrolled. And you could then make the interpretation that they were both fathers and they were enrolled in the Senate. But using this word quique is basically reiterating the fact that these are separate things, those who were fathers and those who were enrolled. And it seems clear that during the senator, during the, the um, regal period, during the time of the kings in particular, that the Senate was an advisory body of, of, of people with a, a, rota with a, a not a permanent membership who were basically used by the kings as counselors. Um, and uh, there was no reason to think that it was an exclusively patrician organization. And in fact, there's lots of reasons to think that it wasn't. And then the second question, and this is uh, um, became one of the most ex one of the most controversial questions in scholarship is was the consulship exclusively patrician during the, the early Republic, uh, but it would seem to be so easily refuted. The first consul of the Republic uh, was Lucas Junius Brutus is a patrician and he is claimed as a, I mean, was a non-patrician. And he's claimed as an ancestor by the Brutus who uh, assassinated Caesar, who says his, uh, um, his lineage went back to the to the Brutus, who was the first consul of the Republic, and the Brutus who killed Caesar was a plebeian. He was not a, a patrician, and patrician status was hereditary. This is a study um, of um, the names of people who were uh, consuls in the first uh, fifty or so years of the Republic and who based on their names, based on the clan portion of their names, these are not patrician names. They're not patrician clans. So there's lots of argument about this, but it seems that there were indeed non-patrician consuls at the founding of the Republic. However, the patricians were a vast majority and when we look at this chart, we see that uh, that over this first 50 years of the Republic, this majority of initially about 80% increased to the point where it, be, it did become an exclusive monopoly of the patricians. So by 427, um, the um, non-patrician um, holders of the consulship had been reduced from around 20% to 1%. And this phenomenon is something that's called by historians the, the closing of the patrician. 
Paul, and how were they elected? No, patricians were, it was hereditary. Okay. You were born into a patrician gaunt, and therefore you were a patrician. But elected as an office, I'm saying. For what? For the, for the Senate? Right. No, the Senate was not elected. Okay. There was, the Senate was not an elective body. The Senate okay. was appointed by the kings, uh, and uh, that's why they, they, you'd say you have the patricians, the patrici, and the conscripti, those who were enrolled. And they were, in the early days, enrolled by the kings and later enrolled by the consuls, uh, and after that by the censors. In the later republic, <laughs> you became a member of the Senate by holding uh, an, another office. So once you were elected to the lowest office, which was the quistership, you became a, men and a member of the Senate. Uh, and that's the way for most of the Roman Republic that people became members of the Senate. But the patricians were, were a, a hereditary group, not elective, and you couldn't become a patrician other than being adopted. And by the way, adoption was very common in Rome. And you, it, it was uh, a very serious thing where uh, if a family was about to die out, you would, uh, a patrician family would have what they called amicitia, friendship, um, amicable relations with other patrician families who would basically donate, if you will, a son who would be adopted by the other family and become uh, essentially for all intents and purpose, considered a member of that family. So for example, Augustus Caesar, he considered himself Caesar, but he was an Octavius who had been uh, adopted posthumously by Julius Caesar. And he did not like to be reminded about that at all. That was very interesting. Um, yeah. And whenever you see a Roman with the a name with the uh, suffix honest, so um, uh, Augustus was called Octavianus. That means that he was originally an Octavian who had been adopted into a different gods. We'll talk about later about Scipio Aemilianus. He was an Aemilius, the son of Aemilius Paulus, who was then uh, adopted because the Scipios were dying out, uh, and his brother was adopted by the Fabians, another patrician class that was that was dying in it. Hey, Paul? Yeah. A, a quick question. Going back, to, you, you had a slide before about the sources um, of uh, this, the information, how we know what we know. Yeah. I'm wondering the, um, the physics sort of the physicality that like the books or the scrolls that those that information was written on. Were those saved in different parts of the empire, or were they okay. over so, to the Greeks, or you know, how did that get saved? So there were, um, there were some original documents which were called the Fasti and the Annals. These were the names of the consuls, and then the Annals were just um, a very short uh, description of the major events that went on in, in any particular year, which would have to do with. Um, uh, the the dedication of temples was extremely important. Uh, victories in in war, people who celebrated triumphs, and these things had been. Um, I think they were collected in, in in the capital, in the temple of Jupiter. So I would guess that they were not destroyed by the Gauls, um, but there were other things uh, that were described by later historians. So we know that um, that that laws of from this period existed during the time of Livy and during the time of, of of the other writers and they saw them though they don't exist now um the later writers Livy and so forth um Dionysus of Halicarnassus their work does not survive <coughs> in whole we only have parts of it and the reason that we have it at all is because it was copied and circulated, and ultimately, the um, these were things that showed up in medieval monasteries. Uh, and we owe the existence of, of almost all of this information to the fact that the, the medieval monks would copy 
Latin works of the pagans as examples of Latin style, which they would use to as, as an educational tool, even though it was irreligious. And that's how an awful lot of that's how Cicero and and and, and Cicero is the really great example of a, of a Latin stylist who believed in in the the ancient gods, but was copied and preserved in in monasteries. And that's where so much of this material was actually preserved. And that's how we have it. Well, in that case, would it would it be um, it's the, the, this saving of this information only be done by the European monks and not the Arabs? Did the Arabs play no part in recording? Because they did my, my understanding. They did the bulk of of a saving of the ancient Greek um, uh, philosophers and, and plays and things like that. So yeah, absolutely. The you're absolutely right about the the preservation of, of Aristotle and and uh, and people of that sort. I'm not aware of of um, Roman uh, political history being preserved in any way by by the Arabs. Uh, the Arabs didn't exist uh, as a as a as a force in the world at this period in time and no no their but they did their, their um their their regard for the philosophers was because of the power of their ideas they felt that the ideas had something to say to them but they didn't have that sort of reverence for rome yes yeah, so i was thinking that the, the details of the roman empire might have been just simply not interested interesting for their accumulation of exactly of exactly. wisdom and truth that's right that's right and this is when here we're not even talking about the empire we're talking about you know, when the Republic was a, a small city state. Right, thank you. Okay. Um, so we have some questions and these are a def a, a, a reflection of uh, what I said before. Um, did the uh, division between uh, patricians and plebeians exist since the very founding of the city. Uh, and uh, furthermore, um, the later definition of a, of, of a plebeian is anyone who is not a patrician. So you have this black and white uh, binary view of Roman society. You had this tiny group of patricians, and it was tiny. And then you had everybody else called the plebeian, and the historians took this for granted and projected this back as being the way that Roman society existed at the time that the Republic was formed. And I'm going to present the arguments for why that is not the case. So, uh, oh, I wanted to go back and just point this out. So uh, this process of the closing of the patriciate, this was also associated with the tendency among the patricians to discourage intermarriage between patricians and non-patricians. And um, it had the, the effects of basically taking the non-patrician aristocrats and excluding them from public life, excluding them from the consulship and excluding them from permanent social integration with the patricians by means of intermarriage. So, in many ways, they were creating their own opposition by doing this. So the actual uh, social structure of Rome was extremely complicated. And I want to show you how there were these overlapping categories, which the Romans used to describe themselves and the ancient writers used to describe the, the, the early republic. Uh, and we'll see that, that the Romans uh, fit into many overlapping categories. And the idea of just saying, okay, you're a patrician, you're a plebeian, that's what it is, that's your, your identity. This is really not the way, not a useful way of looking at Roman society. So I'm showing here the uh, thing that I showed with the um, the centurion assembly and i've extended it to show you the cavalry which is kind of shorthand for the aristocracy and on the right the proletarians and this entire group was called the populus romana the roman people 
one of the major, most important structures in Rome was the patron-client relationship. Um, and uh, this went on for hundreds of years throughout the entire existence of Rome. And during the later empire, it was actually codified in law in terms of what were the obligations of the patrons to their clients and much more importantly, the obligations of clients to their patron. But it goes all the way back to before the founding of the Republic. So this uh, thing that I'm showing here, the Lapis Satricanus, uh, was something I showed in my previous presentation. Um, it's uh, something which is basically an oath taken by the followers of one of the patrician clans in which it basically says that we who are the uh, the sodales, the, the brothers or you of you will um, of uh, of this patrician family uh, are dedicating ourselves to Mars essentially an oath that they were taking to be retainers military followers of their warlord this is the, the prime example of clients of a patron. And there's lots of examples in the early Republic of basically uh, of uh, patricians mobilizing their own followers, private armies and carrying on private wars. Um, but also keep in mind that it wasn't just limited to soldiers, but in order to be somebody's client, you had to have something worthwhile to give. Uh, certainly, the, the vast majority of the, of, the, of the population were not clients of particular patrons because they had nothing to offer. You had to be able to give something in order to, to obtain that relationship. But once you were in that relationship, these were people that were reliable source of support for the, the patron in all aspects of public life. Um, so, Paul, what, a, a question about that. Um, so when you say that there weren't a lot of people that were would qualify for being a client because of not having something to offer, what yeah. about their uh, offering like young men as, uh, you know, part of their military? Well, those were, well, first of all, to, those people were, were, were um, well, if you were young and um, and, war, and and willing to and able to function as a soldier, uh, absolutely, that was what you had to offer. That made you a real good candidate for being somebody's client, and it was the the, the original meaning of it, um, the original function of it. But it also would mean you know, rich farmer it would mean. Uh, somebody who had influence, somebody who had connections, who had access to wealth, who had access to things that were desirable and useful in the society. But military capability was absolutely that. And you can certainly imagine that these patricians had a small circle of, co of, of um, companions, just like we hear of Alexander the Great and his companions, this Tori, uh, who um, you know, who served them directly. They were their retainers and served as their private army. Okay, Paul, so. I'm sorry. Sorry. Were you finished there, Paul? No, go ahead. Okay, so, um, uh, and maybe I missed this. So uh, cavalry, I get heavy infantry, light infantry, I get what kind of military unit are the proletarians? And then what's the difference between the proletarians and the populace, the, the people? Okay, so um, the proletarians are not part of any military unit. Okay, so it's okay. They're, they're, they're not permitted to serve in the army because they don't even have enough property to, to, to provide themselves the ability to function as a missile, as a slinger in the army. However, understand that this was a very small group in early Rome, right? Rome was a, an agrarian society. Uh, and so having the proletariat is usually associated with people who were in the cities. And this was a relatively small group in the early Republic, but they're not part of the army. So but it, the pop, yeah, go ahead. I, I was confused. It's on, it's on the same line as the three other military. So I'm reading military into this. Then well, that I I'm, not but I'm, I'm, I'm using this kind of as a shorthand for equating this with a level of 
of material ability, of material possessions and, and wealth and status within the society. So I'm, I'm saying that there's a continuum that goes from the highest aristocracy down to the people who, in fact, the proletariat at some point were called the uh, the Kapiti Kensi, which means Kapiti is uh, head, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Kensi is, is count. So they were called the head count, which is to say, you could say that these were the people who were so poor that they could not afford to own even a single slave. That was kind of the definition of the proletariat. Okay. You had to have a slave to have enough property be, to be shown as a, as a functioning person who is enfranchised. And so the head count were the people who had nothing except their own head to count. That's all they had. So these um, uh, these patrons um, are, and did they fund the military um, by, through their taxes, and then that gets spent by someone who, like a, a, the equivalent oh, of a ministry, is, or did they this is raise not a public, This is not a public function, right? This is this is not at this point in time. It's not something that's part of the state structure. It's something that predates the the, the state structure, I, and. Uh, and really, you've got to think about it as a gang. Uh, so, so it's the latter, not the former. I'm sorry, what are the latter and the former? No, the, 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 for, the, the, the first one I was, I was thinking, that the, the two options I was thinking of how this got funded was the, the, the former being um, the, the taxes from the rich being collected, and the latter, um, the rich funding or raising a battalion or raising their yeah. own, like, you know, like kind of like, uh, in the, I know in the Union Army that they rich people would raise a battalion or something like that. That's exactly what it was. Okay, so it's the latter then. Okay, thanks. But let me also say there were other clients. It, you know, there would be the military followers would be they they would get some direct support, but there'd be other clients who were were uh, who became clients because they were independently. Uh, uh, affluent or, or economically important and therefore provided access to resources for their patrons. And the patrons could, could ease the way for them in terms of when they needed a favor done for them uh, legally, uh, when they needed uh, someone to, to represent them in a lawsuit. That's one of the main things that patrons did. So uh, it was, it was a, a private uh, you know, kind of organization. It was, I wouldn't call it informal, as you see these people took an oath, kind of reminds me very much of the mafia, to tell you the truth, of taking the blood oath. Um, but uh, they were, it was not a, it was not a regulated state sanctioned. It had nothing to do with taxation and had to do with what was in the interest of these patrons. How did they create great influence? And let me say that um, one of the things that used to freak the senators out was when one of their number, one, when a senator would be in a position to, like in one fell swoop, accumulate a huge number of clients that would make them uh, basically uh, too powerful within the state. And that would be a reason for the senators to turn on one of their numbers. So whenever you would hear, so for example, uh, there's a politician named Marcus Livius Drusus in the in the first century BC who tried to enfranchise the Italians. And uh, he, be, he was murdered um, and we never know who it was, but it would seem to be by senators because they felt that by enfranchising the Italians, he would make them all into his clients. And then he would be the preeminent man in the state, having all of the Italians part of his, his clientele. Okay, patrons and clients really exist throughout the Republic. Uh, always something to, is, is a fundamental way the, the society is organized. Then I talked about patris and conscripti, the fact that within the Senate itself, they were not exclusively patricians. There were others who were there appointed for one reason or another by the initially by the kings, later by the consuls. Then we had the division between seniors and juniors. I also talked about that last time. It's kind of obvious. 
uh, but they had different responsibilities. And then other ways of slicing and dicing the population. So uh, the heavy infantry uh, were uh, referred to by something called, basically called the class, the classes. And everybody else was called the infra class, which meant below the class. So that was another, and understand that these heavy entry, these were not patricians, uh, but they were distinguished from the, the rest of the population by being more well-to-do, by having more of a stake, if you will, in the, in the status quo, and that's really important, uh, than uh, people with less wealth, fundamental division of how the society was organized. And then you had some division of something be called the adsidui and the proletariat. The adsidui meant that you were liable for military service uh, and the proletariat was not. And in the later Republic, uh, we, we'll, we'll talk about the Gracchi, um, the Gracchi brothers. Um, the, uh, one of their main concerns was the fact that the, the adsidui were basically going away, they were disappearing, they were losing their farms, they were losing their wealth, they were becoming proletarianized, and they were championing land reform as a way to keep up the basis for the military draft. Ultimately, the uh, change came when uh, in the first century, or oh, just around the, the around immediately before the year 100 BC, Gaius Marius started recruiting the proletariat into the legions. And that was the big, you know, one of the uh, real forks in the road for the Republic where the armies became private armies and the soldiers now would see their, basically they became clients of their general and would no longer have their primary allegiance to the state. But the Itsidui were um, not, their allegiance was not primarily to their general, it was to the state. It was a constitutional definition, right? So these were all of the complex ways, actually just touching the surface of, of how um, the, the different statuses within, within uh, early Rome that represented Roman identity. Paul, who was controlling this? Who was it basically, you know, like governing that these people were put into different classes? The, Is it the Senate? The, the, the census. The that's census the role, was. That's why the census was so important. Right? Okay. That's and this. The, 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 the role of censor. And that's why the censor, the, the censors at the end of their census would. Uh, would would perform a, a religious service called the lustrum. And the way that they talked about it was they would say that he, they didn't say that he celebrated the lustrum, they would say that he founded the lustrum. And the idea was that each time it was a refounding of the state, right? They, they would come in, they would look at the population and they would, re, it was a re, refounding of the state every five years based on the on the work of the of the censors and, and the censors were were who the censors was an elect was ultimately an elected uh position um and it was the the most uh, prestigious of the the roman magistrates even though they did not have imperium right they did not have the power of command they did not have the power of life and death. They didn't command armies, but they had this ability to basically control who was what. Yeah. And Cato the Elder was the censor. Yeah, was Cato uh, yeah. Was, was known as Cato the censor. That's oh, the okay. way he's known to history. Huh, okay, and, thank you. And uh, by the way, the, the censor, as in all of these Roman offices, the, the Romans had this notion of, of the collegiate office. In other words, there were two censors, just as there were two consuls. There were more than two praetors. There were more than two questors. The only Roman office of which there was only one is the dictator, and which is an extraordinary office. And that's what, and by the way, the dictator, there was no appeal 
from the decisions of the dictator. The dictator could uh, sentence somebody to death immediately on the spot, no recourse of any kind, no appeal. So you did not mess with the dictator. But otherwise, the Romans uh, wanted to basically control and avoid tyranny. So, which is the rule of one person. So they 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 came. They had this idea of the collegiate magistrate. So there were more than one censor, and we see later on that you'd get conflicts between two censors. So you'd have one censor who would be kind of um, a, a Puritan, and he would try to strike from the rolls senators who had a luxurious lifestyle or who were immoral or things like that. But his colleague would object to it. And the Roman political system was set up so that whenever there was a tie, they did nothing, right? It was kind of like a constant filibuster. Uh, so um, if the two censors disagreed, they wouldn't, there'd be no decision. There'd no be, they wouldn't move on. But the, the, the censor, if they were in agreement, could really radically revise the, the, the composition of the state and who was the center and uh, later Sulla as dictator reconstituted the Senate. That was one of his major accomplishments was to, you know, basically move back the clock was his attempt to reconstitute the Senate. Okay, so we have all these, these uh, classifications of status. And then we look at this, this idea of taking a, a fraction of the aristocracy and then putting everybody else into this plebeian camp and saying, well, you know, this is a, the way to, to analyze or understand the Roman Republic. But the fact is, it's not, a use, it's not a useful category. It's not a useful way to understand the rise of the plebeians or the, the constitution of the early Roman state. And here's the way to think about it. There was something that that uh, that that um, uh, Cornell calls the plebeian political organization. And we're going to talk about this. And the way that you understand this is not everybody who is not a, a, a patrician was a member or or identified with the plebeian with the plebeian political organization, in particular, the richer farmers, uh, well-to-do people, people who, who, who were real good with the status quo, who liked their lives, who didn't want to shake things up. There was no way, there was no reason for them to associate with the, with the, the plebeian organization. The plebeian organization, one thing all of the sources are unanimous is saying that these were the poor people. These were people who were oppressed by debt. These were people who had no land, who were land hungry. Uh, these were um, uh, ex-soldiers who no longer had been lost their farms and, and were destitute and so forth and so on. And this idea is something that happened later after the, the plebeians were gradually uh, absorbed, or or let's not say absorbed, but let's say integrated with the Roman state. So the way that that um, Cornell puts it, he says that that the the plebeian political organization created the plebeians, not the other way around. That this this later division of the whole society between patricians and plebeians was a result. It wasn't a cause. It wasn't the way things originally were. So. Um, so Greg briefly talked about this event in uh, 494 called the um, secession of the plebes, and it's it's presented as a um, an event where the plebeians basically walked out. They went on. They they basically left Rome. They went to a place called the the Mon Sacrum, it means the Sacred Mountain, which is about two miles north or northwest of Rome on the Tiber, and uh, the and formed essentially their own organization. 
and um, started creating political institutions. Now, let me one comment that I'll make about this. As we'll see, it's pretty clear that there must have been among these plebeians, there must have been some uh, a cadre. There must have been a, peop, uh, a group who were not poor, who were not destitute, who were not debtors, uh, but affiliated with them. And we may look towards the, the uh, aristocrats, the non-patrician aristocrats who were basically forced out <laughs> and put on the outside. And they were essentially an intelligentsia. And like in most religions, there is an intelligentsia that leads the mob, and that's why we're going to call this a revolution and not a rebellion. And this is what they accomplished. They, they established tribunes, and initially there were two tribunes, and it clearly was an imitation of the two consuls. But this was increased uh, ultimately until there were 10 tribunes. Now, the first, most important uh, attribute of the tribunes was that they were sacrosanct by a lex sacrata. That means a sacred law. And uh, I talked about the relationship between politics and religion. And this shows you that this was not a monopoly of the patricians. It shows you the, the plebeians turning the tables and using religion as an organizing principle. So the idea was the tri tribunes were made in untouchable by a sacred law. And if you, uh, if you hurt a tribune, if you injured a tribune, if you even obstructed a tribune, you became accursed. And what that meant is that everything was, you were, your life was forfeit and anybody could kill you without any penalty of law. So um, this was the fundamental basis for the power of the tribunes, was that the plebes would kill you if you messed with them. And many, you know, centuries later, when we talk about the emperors, the emperors uh, adopted the powers of many different previous Roman magistrates. And the emperors were, uh, 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 adopted the sacrosanctness of the tribunes as being one of their most important attributes. And you, you couldn't mess with them. You were now uh, had religious um, uh, curses and, and uh, consequences for anybody who, who messed with you. And based on this, the tribunes could impose fines, they could imprison people, and ultimately they could even uh, impose the death penalty. Uh, they could intervene and protect individual plebeians from ill treatment. Uh, they would go in and take someone who had been um, attacked and maybe uh, um, proposed the uh, execution by a consul, and they would say, no, you can't do this. I protect this individual. And um, gradually, um, this, uh, after 449, as they were gradually becoming um, uh, integrated with the state, they had, the, they, they, um, had what was called uh, the ability to, to intercede. And this became the famous tribunician veto. Veto means I forbid. Uh, and Basically, the veto was something that the tribune could do to just about anything. They could veto a law. They could veto a decision by a magistrate. They could veto a meeting of the Senate. And it was a huge power. And the problem would become when tribunes would veto each other, which would lead us to the Gracchi and the destruction of the Republic later on. The second thing they organized was the plebeian assembly, the Council of the Plebes, Concilium Plebis, Plebis. It was open to all citizens except patricians. And what it did was vote on laws, on proposals offered by the tribunes. And it was voted by local tribes, by location. And uh, Cornell is, is really emphatic that the, the, uh, the Plebeian assembly never adopted centuries. It's never been associated with them at all. 
and the, the, the proposals that were adopted by the plebs were plebiscites, not lex. So in, in, uh, in Latin, the word lex means law, but lex means something that was approved by one of the uh, assemblies of the entire Roman people, the Centurion Assembly or the later Tribal Assembly, but something that was approved by the, only by the plebeians was called the plebiscite. It was binding on the plebs. And the real problem became, well, you know, was this uh, binding on the patricians by people who didn't consider them parts of the plebs? And the answer basically was, uh, this was extra legal. This was something which was being enforced by the threat of force or the actual use of force. Uh, and gradually, uh, was recognized as binding by the state in steps where in the beginning the patricians um, retained the right to uh, say that they had to approve these decisions and ultimately uh, that was abolished uh, and the, 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 the plebeians would grant other concessions at the same time. This was a constant negotiation in the formation of the state. And the last um, thing that I'll talk about is the creation of the uh, of the, the the plebes was the office of of edile or edile, um, and uh, in the later republic uh, they had the the job of as as Greg said um, maintaining the streets and the marketplace and sanitation and all that stuff, but initially their purpose was basically to be assistance to the tribunes to help them whatever they needed to, to have done. And um, in particular, they were associated with the goddess uh, Sirius, who was the goddess of written laws. And they uh, created, an, a, a, they were the first permanent archive of the state. And they demanded and, and obtained the right to get the proceedings of the Senate that were secret. Senate was conducted its business behind closed doors. And uh, the ediles, the ediles could, uh, were able to get the proceedings of the Senate. And then they created this archive in the temple of Ceres. So the association of the ediles with this temple. And um, Cornell makes the point that in many ways, this structure was more advanced than the institutions of the Roman state at the time that this occurred. And many of these, uh, these innovations were then adopted by the Roman state. So the Roman state later created quaestors to assist the consuls, which really were mimicking the role of the aediles in, in supporting the, the tribunes um, and the idea of the archive and so forth. Um, uh, and uh, the the ultimately the most important legal body under the Republic was the tribal assembly that was based on the voting by local tribes that happened in the in the plebeian assembly. So summing up, the plebeian movement was a remarkable phenomenon, and as far as we know, it was without parallel in the history of the ancient city state. Nowhere in the historical record is there anything like this. It was a revolutionary organization. The plebs created a union which, they, which, which would have to defend itself by violence if, ne if necessary against the forces of the state. And the clearest sign of this is the Lex Socrata, the sacred law, which allowed the plebs and its officers to intervene in the political arena and enforce their will by a system of lynch justice. And in essence, the way to think about this is what the plebs had created is a state within the state. This is what was referred to initially by Theodore Momsen, great historian, the first modern historian of Rome. Uh, and their institutions, as I said, were more advanced in many ways uh, and sophisticated those than those of the Roman state and influenced the Roman state to create its own version and um, the, the Romans, the state ultimately created the post of Curial, um, uh, Adile, C-U-R-U-L-E, 
which means um, that it was an official Roman magistrate. Um, the 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 uh, consuls and Roman magistrates used to sit on a special ivory folding chair. You're sure you've seen pictures. That's called the curile curule chair, and so the the magistrates created were the curule ediles again based on the inspiration from uh, the plebeian ediles. Um, and they were the first to create the, con the notion that the official decisions of the state should be officially archived and preserved and point out that the, the idea of having written laws and having them preserved was always a something that the common people would agitate for against the aristocracy because it would basically set out limits for what the aristocracy could do. It prevented the aristocracy from being arbitrary. And throughout, throughout the ancient world, you always see there's a, the, the push for written law is associated with an ability to restrain the arrogance and the arbitrary nature of power execute uh, 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 exercised by the aristocracy uh, essentially in Rome a plebeian demand if you will and uh, with that I'm going to open the floor for questions and say thank you very much for your attention that's the end of my presentation Paul uh, thank you so much this was really good incredible and um you guys work so well in collaboration. One presentation, you know, mm. follows by another great presentation, you know, two great presentations back to back. So go ahead, hey. open up questions. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Really? Paul, 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 Greg, thank you very much. Great presentation. Uh, Paul, question. Uh, it seems like uh, creating this plebeian organization it couldn't be done by some genius or small group of genius. So actually should be somebody one who came up with this idea and had enough of force intellectual uh, charisma and so on to, no, there is no name in history or any well, the, guesses. There, there, are, there are names, but the, the, the point that Coronel makes is that the, the, uh, the stories about them are so mutually contradictory, even within single sources. They're internally contradictory, they're legendary, and they're clearly an anachronistic where they look at the, they take the Gracchi and they kind of project that back 400 years mm -hmm. and say, well, that's what these things were. So that's why what, what, what the way that, that Cornell approaches is he says, well, look at the institutions. We can't know who did it. We can't know how we did it, but we can see what the result was. We have mm -hmm. the institution of the tribune. We have the institution of the plebiscite. We have the, the, the tribunician veto. And mm -hmm. these things are real. These things we can say come back from the original, you know, the original founding of these institutions. But no, so there's, wanna... there's no doubt about the fact that a bunch of, of you know, of um, landless, um, you know, debt debtors, people, you know, trying to uh, escape debt slavery and, uh, and so forth, they didn't come up with this. But we also see that there was an, 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 uh, an aristocratic or a group that had been excluded mm -hmm. by the, the action of the patriciate. So there was clearly a group that had been part of the governing class that, you know, that knew how all this stuff worked mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. were able to organize. And that's why I say it was, it was a revolution and not a rebellion. And you look at the results that came out of this of permanent institutions. I mean, how many rebellions, mm -hmm. you know, result in permanent institutions that be, that change the state and become adapted by the state? That's, you know, one of the mm -hmm. real unique flavors of studying Rome. Mm -hmm. is, as I said, this, this uh, negotiation mm -hmm. that goes on between the different components of Roman society. And, you know, it's not that it's all done peacefully. There's lots of conflict and so forth. And oh, by the way, when the when the you know part of the story when the plebeians seceded, um, it's all often presented as the soldiers refusing to fight. Mm -hmm. And what happened is that the patricians, many of the patricians, came forward and said, "We don't need them. 
we have our own clients. We can mm -hmm. raise an army out of our own followers. So you see that interpenetration. So their followers were not patricians, but mm -hmm. they were not part of the plebeian political organization either. There were mm -hmm. people that could have been mobilized by the patricians, you know, say, well, we don't need these plebeians, let them walk out. But of course, and I will also add that the reason why you saw my diagram, I did not include the bulk of the heavy infantry in the plebeian organization. Because first of all, if, they, if the heavy infantry, the phalanx, had been part of the plebeians, the political organization, that would have been it. There would have been no way to resist them. Mm -hmm. because of the overwhelming that that was the military power of the state so and there's also if you know these rich farmers there's no reason to believe one of the primary demands of the plebes throughout their existence was land redistribution if you're a wealthy farmer that's the last thing in the world that you want and as i say these people were not patricians they were wealthy people who succeeded and were part of the status quo I, I wanted to refer your member to Coriolanus, who got his name by taking the city Corioli from uh, Volscians. That's happened exactly when the secession, first secession happened, just uh, like half a year later in 493 BC. And he did it without Pleb, uh, uh, plebeians. And that's why he was so much against them after, uh, after all. But the main thing is that, again, uh, during the sack of Rome by Gauls, all the documents were burned. And uh, maybe there are some copies, like we know that the, uh, there were 12 tables um, uh, of a uh, constitution uh, where they wrote down, they were also burned, but there were copies of them made and from them they restored them uh, later on. But most of the documents uh, they burned and, and the oral tradition maintains all the glorious uh, people, you know, like Coriolanus and uh, uh, Camillus, but uh, nobody really cares about some uh, uh, people who modify laws, who like <laughs> that, you know, that doesn't stay in the oral tradition that much. Okay, thank you very much. You know, the, the, the interesting case of the second consul. Uh, uh, um, uh, well, thanks very much, Paul. Is, pardon me? I'm sorry, I was just saying, thank you for the, uh, the presentation. I have to go. Oh, glad you could attend. Uh, so the story of I to fill out the, 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 story, the story of, of you know, uh, of a, an elected official um, being turned upon by the aristocracy and being cast off the Tarpian rock, you know, it, interestingly, this, this second consul who was consul during the session of the plebes was the first person to introduce a land reform legislation in Rome and was accused of wanting to become king. As I said, whenever you saw somebody who, an aristocrat that, that supported popular demands, the, other, the patricians would immediately say, oh, he wants to be king. And they convicted him of treason and they threw him off the rock. Interesting. Wow. So guys, uh, again, thank you, Paul and Greg. Don't forget to fill out the doodle, you know, uh, it's just uh, Richard wants to gauge the days that people want to see his, um, you know, uh, um, Arab and uh, Middle Eastern presentations from medieval time. Uh, so, you know, just look to see if it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and some Saturdays that were free from the uh, Roman uh, 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 subject matter. <clears throat> so that could be a series starting in July. Appreciate it, guys. Uh, this was incredible. Uh, on Wednesday, don't forget, we do have Greg presenting Dion uh, by Plutarch. So if you can read it, if not, you know, we will just discuss it. Greg usually does a good job of getting an excerpt and, you know, it's preferential to read it, but if, if not, we go yeah, We're going to be reading an excerpt anyway. Uh, yeah, we're going to be reading way. excerpts and then Greg goes through them pretty elaborately. <clears throat> and then uh, on Thursday, I'm presenting Volga Bulgars. Hopefully this time I'll do it. <laughs> um, I Last time I had to postpone it. Um, and 
uh, since we're presenting Bulg Bulgars, we need to present H Hazars too, because we did Kiev and Rus. Yeah. We're doing, you know, Bulg Bulgars. If we're not presenting Hazars, that, that just doesn't. Uh, when you say Hazars, you mean K H A A Z A R, not H U S S A R. K H A A. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and there should be an interesting one. I don't know if anybody wants to take it out. Maybe someone in uh, August, but uh, you know, it should be an interesting one. That's the only Jewish state in the medieval time. Uh, so. <laughs> so they were not ethnically Jew. They were, they were the not. They were Turkic tribe. tribe. Yeah, and they're the ones who destroyed Bulgar. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I mean, Jewish rel religion was prevalent. But we don't know how many Jews actually lived there, too. So it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly it was uh, from the top, or from the so it's, uh, aristocracy that became Jewish. Uh, uh, and then uh, I, I, we don't know how uh, it, it disseminated to the population, how widely it was. It usually takes centuries um, uh, for the full dissemination, uh, you know. But uh, yeah, it's uh, yeah, interesting. Not 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 also not that much known uh, about it. But, right. Yeah, they were very powerful. Uh, yeah, it would uh, be mostly Russians conquering them, trade. You know, uh, land. You know, also the uh, <clears throat> the Muslim trader um, uh, that visited Hazars. Uh, <clears throat> um, Al Khaldun, right? Al Khaldun. And that's basically it. I mean, there's not really much to it, but you can talk about the states around it and the development and whatnot. It was 300 years you know, or so. Yes, yeah, it's, it's supposedly they're the ones who control the, uh, the key, uh, like prior to Kiev and Rus, this territory was uh, controlled by Khazar prior to the uh, uh, the Vikings coming over, uh, a lot of this territory was uh, where the Kiev is, and uh, were controlled by Khazars. So they were, um, and and also of course you know there is a famous story by Igor Galevi, uh, which is the uh, Jewish scholar uh, from Spain, yes, think, who, yeah. who actually wrote how they supposedly. Uh, it's it's uh, obviously also a, a, a myth. <laughs> but, it's more on the mythical side. Right, yeah. right, right. But uh, kind of an interesting. Thank you, everybody, uh, for today. I want to let everybody go. Next time we meet on Roman, I think it's in two weeks. Have a nice uh, the rest of the weekend. And tomorrow, if you come, uh, tomorrow we have a Turkic presentation by Richard. So do join at four. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Bye.